good morning. Um, what a beautiful Queensland morning it is, Kevin. It is. It's good to be back, actually. I woke up this morning and uh, rediscovered uh, that it is close to God's own country. So. <laughs> Trace and I now live in Manhattan most of the year because I work there. And, uh, but coming back here, you're just always reminded that it's a special place, despite the smoke and haze this morning. It's just a good place to be. Um, well, look, I, I thought uh, it's, it's, it's um, uh, quite traditional at these events to acknowledge country. Um, and uh, while, while the festival has overall acknowledged country, we should do it this morning. But I thought, Kevin, you would be probably the best person I could think of to do this, having delivered the apology and, and probably had a fair bit to do with uh, our, our willingness and ability to acknowledge country. Well, thanks, David. So let's begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose lands we meet and whose cultures we honour as the oldest continuing cultures in human history. By the way, uh, since we've been living in the States, I've started this as a minor revolt within, the United, within America. And so some gatherings I now attend where I think I can just get away with it, I begin by honouring the Native Americans um, on whose lands we meet and whose cultures we acknowledge as uh, the original uh, inhabitants. Uh, of this great land we now call America. Then there's stony silence. <laughs> <laughs> it's catching on, slowly but surely. Yeah. So we're here this morning to have a conversation about, about mm. uh, your book, the second in, in this series, um, on your public life. Um, and when the organisers first approached me, uh, I thought, well, that'll be interesting because you and I have been having conversations about various things for pretty well 30 years, uh, on and off, um, and neither of us have changed a bit. Uh, no, that's right. Yeah, still yeah. svelte and still, you know. <laughs> well, we haven't we haven't changed a bit, but I think I was thinking back to probably when we first met Kevin, and it was maybe eighty eight or eighty nine, and uh, we had lunch at a restaurant called Augustine's, um, and uh, which now is in the middle of um, a, uh, a casino redevelopment. Um, but at the time... Jesus, Mary and Joseph, that's all I can <laughs> say about that. <laughs> but, but at the time, it was a, there was a period of great expectation in Queensland, you know, that the, uh, the corruption and the crookedness of the past was, 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 being, was being seen. There was uh, optimism about where the place could go. And uh, I, I thought before we get into your book, it might be interesting just to reflect on how that's gone. You know, 30 years down the track, are we as far ahead as we thought we should be? Uh, or is there some slippage sometimes? I remember way back then, when we first met, um, back in the Mesolithic period, that um, the, um, uh, I remember coming back to Queensland to be Wayne Goss's chief of staff. I'd been a diplomat in the Foreign Service and Wayne had become leader of the State Parliamentary Labor Party. And uh, as you know, uh, we'd not been entirely successful as a political movement Prior to that, we'd been out of office for 32 years. I, I think um, one of the uh, newspapers used to refer to the Queensland Labor Party as the gang who couldn't shoot straight. That's right. <laughs> well, as Joe Bjorka Peterson used to say, the old guard, the new guard, and the mud guard. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but uh, I just remember coming back and thinking, as someone who's a native son of the soil here uh, and growing up on a farm about 100 miles north of here, that. Uh, it was always a place with infinitely more potential uh, and a much greater future than we were ever giving it credit for. And so uh, the reason I came back was just to see if I could help at the margins uh, this new bloke called Goss uh, try and uh, change the future political direction of the state. And yeah, that was like winning against the gerrymander. Uh, we worked out we had to get 56% of the vote in that election, 89, to win in order to change the electoral laws to make it one vote, one value. So what's the big change? Had we um, failed against the, what was then seen as the invincible National Party, uh, we'd still be, I think, mired in um, electoral corruption and, uh, and a, an entire culture here which was anchored in various forms of, you know, sexism, racism, provincialism, and the rest. Whereas despite all the debates about what goes right and wrong with state government since then, it's just an infinitely more civilised place um, than it used to be. And uh, we should bear that in mind. And I give great credit to Goss for having been 
the guy with the guts and the determination to, to prevail against almost the impossible. Now, when, uh, when you won in 2007, uh, it wasn't just because of Queensland, but, but you certainly carried Queensland in a massive way. Uh, and we've seen in the election just passed that that, that just didn't happen. In fact, it, it's almost ended up that Labor, I think Labor has just one seat north of the Brisbane River. Um, what do you think is, is the element needed to carry Queensland in national politics? Well, there's always a tendency, as we say up here, down south, uh, to conclude that this place is either so radically different that they can never wrap their heads around it, um, or that it's just the same as the rest of the country. You know, it's either we are seen as Appalachia, uh, and you know that we're playing banjos every Saturday morning, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, or that it's uh, not much different from you know from um, inner metropolitan Sydney and Melbourne. You know, it's just different to both those. Proposition. So I think the first principle which any political party needs to comprehend is there's probably five Queenslands. There's here, Brizzy, um, uh, the Gold Coast, which based on any set of uh, economic demographies should be natural labour territory because it's a relatively low income environment. If you look at average income levels, in Gold Coast and the hinterland. And when I go back there and I look at what's happened around Gold Coast in recent times, Perhaps the most recent infrastructure development was my decision to invest in that, um, that uh, rail project which runs right, right along the um, um, surface paradise there to try and link uh, various parts of uh, the coast, uh, including the university and, and with Brisbane. Sunshine Coast, where I grew up, quite different from the Gold Coast and certainly different from here, but then that's a large concentration of seats on both those coasts. Then the provincial cities. And as you know, my friend, each of them's different. Mm. For, to assume that Bundy is like Mackay, is like Townsville, is like Cairns, it's just a nonsense. They're just all different. But each of them is anchored in a federal seat with its own political culture. And then, of course, you've got West of the Divide, uh, which is kind of part of the ongoing romance of the state as well. So I often say to folk uh, in the South, just wrapping your head around the fact it's radically decentralised, and within that decentralisation there are five different you know, identities. And understanding the difference in identities of the place is really important. And I think the second thing is that apart from the resources sector, this is essentially a small business economy. I wish it was a bigger business economy, but it's a small business economy. And therefore, for any political party wishing to obtain 50% plus one here, Unless you've got a policy message, a political message, and a vocabulary which resonates with people out there setting up their first business, employing two or three people, um, then hoping to maybe uh, crack the big time by employing 20 people and having to, the joy of paying payroll tax for the first time, uh, that that's the audience you're actually speaking to in the economy. So I think it's the sense of the reality of regional diversity plus the small business nature uh, of uh, the state's economy. And finally, it's a state where the government has always played a largest role uh, for 150 years. And e even the vigorously free enterprise state governments have played a big role. Well, the they? biggest socialist government we've ever had in this state was the National Party government. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, always socialism in the bush and, uh, and the rest of you can pay for it. So. So, but I mean, it's, but if you look at a big state with a thinnish population, I mean, this state, as I reminded George Bush when I was in office, is three times the size of Texas. Uh, and we've got the population of Arkansas, you know, it's, and so therefore, whether we like it or not, the role of s state government backed by federal government and rolling out the infrastructure here and making sure that you are establishing concentrations of, uh, of, um, of um, technological expertise in various precincts, government has a big role, whether we like it or not, just because of the vast size of the place, relatively small population still. Yeah, because when you, when you go outside of Brisbane, pretty well all of those provincial cities are all having quite hard times at the moment, aren't they? Um, yeah. Well, I was just up in the Sunshine Coast recently and just talking as I do, because you never quite leave office when you've been in politics, you're always talking and, uh, and listening to f sense how things are going. It's pretty flat. 
but not just here, but elsewhere in the country as well. And partly it's structural, partly it's attitudinal, and partly it's the impact of global, uh, global stuff. Free plug for Fagan. <laughs> Uh, has the luck run out? This guy wrote a book earlier this year, and uh, I've only read a review of it. I haven't read it itself, but the thematic is one I agree with, which is that we have become the complacent country. And I, uh, Donald Horne spoke about this a long time ago, ironically, when he described Australia as the lucky country. But to carve out this country's future, it doesn't spontaneously combust. It really does depend on what we do with our hands and our imagination to turn this vast terra australis a long way from anywhere with a small population into a viable, long-term, sustainable, competitive economy and humane society. Uh, and there's just the sort of drift you refer to in that book, in the blurb and on the inside, and what I've seen in the reviews uh, resonates with my view. Now, I think, Kevin, over the many years we've been having conversations, your views on these things have been quite consistent. The need. When have you heard someone say that about a politician? Uh, well, there have probably been bits at the edge where it's not, we won't <laughs> go into that. But um, I, I think what I've seen is, is you, your starting point is, is, is been have a, have a strong economy, which mm -hmm. as you're saying, Queensland comes out of a small business sector. And then if you have that, you have the stability that follows. Um, um, and what we're, what we're now seeing is, is that the economy uh, in Queensland particularly, but, but also in the rest of the country, it's just a little bit thin, isn't it? It's, it's uh, a bit unidimensional. I think so. I mean, um, I asked someone the other night um, over a bite down at the Howard Street Wharf. Have you been down there yet, folks? So I'm, just, I'm quite impressed uh, by uh, how the, the face of the river is changing. Uh, but we're talking about this very question of what is the structural future of our state economy mm. here? And, uh, and I asked him about the future of biotechnology. Um, and this, as you know, since the time of uh, probably the Goss government, certainly the Beatty government through to the present, and a bunch of federal government initiatives, including under our own government, we've been pushing and promoting. And here's the reality. With a combination of the uh, Translational Research Institute here at PA, uh, QMI, uh, the Queensland um, um, QIMR, yep. Institute of Medical Research, um, and um, Institute of Molecular Biology at the University of Queensland. These are big centres of expertise in biomedicine and bioresearch and the life sciences against any global measure. There is a bucket load of people here of high quality. The missing element in the gene pool is taking that to market. <laughs> and we, it's now vital we crack this nut because the market for, let's call it, uh, this whole new generation of uh, biomedicine, uh, this whole new uh, generation of, uh, of life-sustaining uh, drugs and interventions and uh, genomic research and what comes out of it is exploding around the world. Huge new markets and huge new wealth generators and clean and green as well on the way through. So the missing element for us is a local venture capital market and a local capacity to take extraordinary high quality research product here to market. Now that, for me, should be priority number one, knowing what exists as the latent competitive strengths of this part of Australia. So let's, let's talk about that in the context of, of your prime ministership. Do you think that uh, government, and, and your government included, has made enough of a priority as to how to get that to happen? When we were elected uh, at the end of 07, um, we had a pretty big and bold policy agenda out there, including uh, what we'd do in, under the rubric of industry policy. It's a big difference between us and the Conservatives, by the way. Uh, I'm a free market guy. Uh, markets actually generate uh, strong economies. Uh, they are best for prices for working families. Um, the shirt that I'm wearing today uh, costs about 10% in real dollar terms of uh, the price of a shirt when I was a kid growing up, buying a shirt at Chadwick's in Nambour on the corner of Howard and Curry Streets. Because <laughs> um, we could only buy one new one once a year. Because shirts were expensive. 
So that's why I'm a free market guy. But on the Labor Party and its tradition, we've always got it that given the nature of this country, huge territory, small population, isolation from markets, that the role of government is to also get in there and support particular sectors, uh, usually at the research and development end. Um, so we had a lot of programs around that from one form of manufacturing through to the life sciences that we just spoke of. But the reality is an office. You can't predict everything that's going to happen. So this sort of quiet whistling sound of an exocet heading towards the Australian economy during the course of 2008, otherwise called the global financial crisis, was like... You know, it's like one of those terrible scenes in the Blitz. You know that something's about to hit. And, and it was the GFC. And uh, around the world, as you know, David, this was called the Great Global Recession. Because every Western economy went into recession, except ours. So the bulk of my time in office was spent, frankly, working around the clock to try and save this place from recession. And we did, as you know. And part of that's because I'm just old enough and to have had a mum who was just old enough to have been a kid during the Depression. And uh, the stories of my mother uh, as a little girl at the age of nine when the Depression first hit always sent chills through my bones about what it was like not to have food to put on the table. Um, and the risk around the world then was of a, not just a global recession, but the indicators were heading in the direction of a second global depression. So, Many of our industry policy efforts were derailed by this task of existential economic survival. Keeping the economy functioning, which we did, large stimulus injection, and acting with interventions to prevent any financial institution from falling over. So, so at what stage of the game did you come to, to see how serious this was going to be? Was it Because there were signs around at the end of 07 that, that this, was, this was going to be pretty messy. That's true. I mean, uh, Ken Henry, the then Secretary of the Treasury, uh, records this conversation. I can remember part of it. I said to Ken, I need to take you to Queensland and introduce you to the state. Um, so we're in Canberra. We jump on the government jet, fly up here. I think we went to Gladstone. And, uh, and we're looking at uh, the future expansion of uh, industrial developments there, including LNG. And then, as we got on the plane coming back, I said to Ken, so can explain to me what happens if we have a current account crisis? What happens if global financial markets stop functioning? Because historically, we uh, balance our current account in this country through this large inflow of foreign capital on a rolling basis, either through foreign direct investment or through capital flows. Been that way for a long time. So it was a very existential discussion, late 07, early 08, but what really tricked it flipped it in my mind was when I went and saw Bush in the White House in March of 08, um, and I've been reading my daily Bible, which is the Financial Times from London, just to get a sense of what's happening in financial markets. And uh, Bear Stearns, as you know, the uh, American investment bank had just gone, o gone over. Mm. And, uh, and so my first question to Bush had nothing to do with the Iraq war, had nothing to do with all the stuff that we disagreed on. I said, What's happening in your financial markets and what are you doing about it? And without being unkind to George, this was not his shtick, okay? And uh, so he said, but I've got to introduce you to Hank, Hank Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury. So I then go off literally down to the Treasury from the White House. And that's where I began a great friendship with Hank Paulson. And so uh, from that conversation on, I just had a very early sense four or five, six months before Lehman's went over, that we had a fundamental problem on our hands. So I think one of the reasons we were able to act early and effectively was just because I benefited from that relationship with the head of the US Treasury. Yeah. So uh, in, the, in one of the, I'm, I'm going to verbal you a little bit, I think somewhere early in the book you described. I know you're a Queensland copper. <laughs> No, just a Sorry, In the old days, in the old <laughs> days. <laughs> um, uh, you, you describe how, how you were made for these big public policy challenges. This is what, what, what you were set up for. Um, 
In that sense, do, do you think you were made to deal with a GFC for Australia, or do you feel a bit frustrated that it, it, might, it, that it got in the way of other agendas you might have wanted to pursue? Uh, all of the above. I mean, it's, um, we had big plans. You looked at our agenda for the 07 election on economic policy, social policy, the environment, um, indigenous reconciliation, closing the gap, the apology. I mean, this was not a small canvas going into that election. It was a big one. Um, and deliberately so, because beating Howard was not easy. Uh, the idea that governments lose, oppositions don't win, I think is just complete bullshit. Um, I think uh, it's always a cocktail of the above. But um, we had a big agenda, we set out to implement it, and was it frustrating uh, that this thing came along, um, which wasn't of our making, it was because of the failure to regulate effectively US domestic financial markets uh, through decisions taken in the late 90s and early noughties. Yeah, it was frustrating as hell, but you don't get a choice in national political life. Your first responsibility is the national security of the country and the economic stability uh, of the nation. And everything else, frankly, rests on top of that. So. I think the best way to answer your question is, I felt as if I was doing two jobs at once. One is uh, uh, saving the economy and its financial institutions. You have one bank fall over, imagine the run. And we got very close to having one fall over, very close. And secondly, um, because we succeeded at that, and there was no recession, and we kept unemployment, remarkably, with a five in front of it, it's about what it is today, actually, in the middle of the financial crisis. Um, no one here in this country, in the public, knew that there was a recession going on in the rest of the world. They'd say, what recession? So why don't you get on, Kevin, with implementing your pre-election agenda? Yeah. <laughs> of course, that's difficult financially at that point because you've spent so much resources on just keeping the economy afloat. So doing two things at once was really hard. So your, uh, your, your political opponents would and do say that Australia's ability... I didn't know I had any, so... <laughs> Name uh, them. Um, alphabetically or, <laughs> or by serial number? Uh, chronologically. Let, let, <laughs> let me reframe that. Your, your political opponents from the other side of Parliament... All oh, right, um, OK. That's, that's a much... That's a much smaller list. <laughs> w would, would and do say that, that Australia's ability to weather uh, that period was because of the surpluses they, that they built up, their strong management of the economy. There's a bit to that, isn't there? I mean, there were the, the, bu the budget was in a pretty good condition when you came into office. No, I've recorded that in the book. Uh, so I, don't, I just don't think you can lie about these things. Yeah, the state of public finance was good, but it equally, you know, as an economist yourself, David, the reason for that, which was, um, frankly, uh, the decade after the recession we had to have in 1991. Uh, these were boom times for Australia, uh, the explosion of the China market. Um, so being uh, treasurer of the Commonwealth, if you're Peter Costello, was like every Monday morning just waking up and going, cha-ching, uh, as the money rolled in at least after the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Uh, for that period, 97 to 2007, these were boom times. You did not have to try hard to balance the books. You did not have to try hard to have savings. And you did not have to try hard to invest in something called the Future Fund. But to give Costello credit, he established the Future Fund. Costello's greatest challenge in that government was to keep John Howard's hands off the cash, as you know. Yeah. Um, and that's why I put Costello onto the board of the Future Fund after he left politics, because I thought on that measure he'd done a reasonable job. I think uh, it's recorded, if not Costello's book, one of the other books that written about that government, that, that Costello's office actually produced a fake version of the budget to send to the PM's office so he couldn't, um, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't get his hands on the money to hand out more electoral sweeteners. I was at Tim Fisher's uh, state funeral the other day in, at Albury. And Albo and I were the only two Labor voters in the room. And uh, there's about a thousand folks there. But because of the order of precedence, this arcane uh, protocols laid down by the Commonwealth since Runnymede on the Thames, um, I'm sitting next to Howard, Jeanette's there, and Costello's sitting behind us. And um, I can guarantee you, I had a friendlier conversation with each of them individually than they had with each other. <laughs> <laughs> 
let's just let's just talk about about those sorts of conversations and how people uh, see uh, public figures, particularly in retrospect. W when Tim Fisher died, um, there was a great outpouring about the decency of Tim Fisher, uh, mm. about his uniqueness. Um, but it wasn't always like that for Tim Fisher. I think there was a time where people just, uh, you know, w were laughing at, at his quirkiness and 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 not believing that he could be at all competent. Yet we get 15 years down the track and we look back, um, look look at look back at that through rose-coloured glasses. Mm. I guess my question on that is: uh, are, are, Have we been and are we still too hard on how we judge uh, people in contemporary political and public life? I think it is one of the um, one of the problems in our public political culture here is we do slice and dice people too viciously and too early. I mean, there are times to slice and dice. In my judgment, it was never early enough for Tony Abbott, uh, was, and and for that matter, Mark Latham. I mean, both unique contributions to the national body politic. Um, but, you know, outside those particular extremes, most folk that I've known in national political life are out there trying as hard as they can, and they will stuff certain things up. That's just the nature of the beast. But we need to be a little more forgiving in our public political culture, I think, uh, about such things. Tim, if you, as you mentioned, I mean, I appointed him as Australia's first ambassador to the Holy See, resident ambassador. Uh, he nearly died, literally, when I rang him at uh, Boree Creek on the property and said, your country needs you, I'm sending you to the Vatican. And uh, he said, uh, what have I done to sin? And uh, I said, well, plainly not enough if I'm sending you to the Vatican. But, um, but you're right. I mean, there was a, at the time when he was active in politics, Tim opposed Mabo quite vehemently. Uh, Tim uh, also uh, was borderline homophobic. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but you know something? In national political life, you're always going to have um, odd elements to the cocktail. <laughs> and uh, if you take the broad sweep of a person's political career uh, or a public career, I think we need to be a little more generous in our assessments mm. of people. So, except uh, for Abbott. Mm. Except for Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> and Latham, to be bipartisan. <laughs> and the One Nation Party, which he now proudly leads in New South Wales. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> have you uh, caught up with Malcolm Turnbull in New York? Have I what? Caught up with Malcolm Turnbull in New York? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Malcolm sent me a few messages, but um, I'm not quite in the state of uh, intellectual equanimity that would enable me to engage in a you know, gentle, friendly, collegial conversation. Oh, so he's texted, but, but you're not willing to be? Uh, but, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, well, actually, there's a reason for it, which is uh, just so that my local folks here in Brisbane understand is that Malcolm and I had always been relatively close, despite the fact that uh, his political temperament was such. You remember this, I think you wrote it to the Courier Mail at the time. He, he stood up in Parliament and accused me of corruption when I was Prime Minister. This was over the so called Utegate affair. If you dig back into the recesses of Australian political history, never, and the problem I'll, was I'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah, no, you were at the time, and so I, we had words. But uh, the uh, but it was not just an utter lie; it was a fabricated concoction by a uh, public servant who was acting as a Liberal Party leak, who actually forged a document in order to advance the case. And that's all proven and established and laid down. It's what caused Turnbull to lose his job that's right, yeah. when he's leader of the opposition. So anyway, despite that, and when Malcolm went through the ditch afterwards and announced that he was leaving Parliament, do you remember this? That's right, yeah. Uh, I actually had him round to, the lot, uh, to Kirribilli in Sydney and said, OK, mate, this is, um, you know, you're heading off. I said, why don't I make you ambassador for the environment? Because Malcolm actually had one strength back then, which is that he had an environmental sensibility. And so... Um, um, uh, he was kind of bowled over by that because that's not what they do. That's, what, that's not what the Conservatives do with us. And so he's thought about it, but then he then reconsidered and then went back into Parliament and the rest is history. But later on, uh, when I was considering being a candidate for UN Secretary General uh, from New York, uh, both he 
And Julie Bishop had said to me on multiple occasions privately, we the government will back you and nominate you. And so therefore, with the Australian diplomatic mission in New York, we ran a two year long uh, diplomatic campaign in support of my candidature. Except when Turnbull's political position of the Liberal Party started to weaken and is under attack from both Dutton up the road here, um, uh, Voldemort, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and Morrison, I won't say anything there, our Prime Minister, the, uh, uh, he buckled and that's, so, uh, and if you look at him second time around, it's an interesting question in political history. If you judge when uh, Turnbull's uh, political stocks crashed the second time, uh, when he made that decision, most Australians' reaction was, that's just kind of un-Australian. And so you'll see his numbers crashed by about 10 points straight after that and never recovered. Interesting, when you take decisions for the wrong reason. Uh, what often unfolds, and I've seen some of that in my own life as well. Yeah. So you, you used the expression before about political slicing and dicing, and probably you you would be the most prominent uh, slicey and dicey. Uh, in That's in the, the passive sense, rather yes, than the active yeah, sense. Yeah. Slicey and the dicey. recipient, not the executor. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so you, and you describe this in the book um, as as there was just no. Um, really strong building up signs that, that this was coming. I mean the coup. Yeah, yes, that's right. That's yeah. right yeah. Um, have you forgiven any of the perpetrators? Absolutely. Because you just, you know, my mother always taught me, you know, don't end up bitter and twisted, you know. It's, um, it's no matter where you are in life, there are people who are going to do you in the eye, you know. My mother was a nurse in a hospital and she would roll home about uh, and tell me late at night, after she'd finished night shift or whatever, uh, the evening shift, not the night shift, uh, how she'd been sliced and diced by the, the matron for something she'd never done. So all this happens in everyone's life. So the question is, do you carry it as some sort of nurtured uh, grief and hurt for the rest of your life and so uh, turn yourself into a bitter and emaciated person or whether you don't? So my judgment is, and part of the reason for writing a book is saying, here is the account of what happened uh, I've done it in two volumes. I've done it with a combination of two and a half thousand footnotes. Uh, anyone who wants to sue me for any inaccuracy, go ahead. No one has. If you challenge any element of fact in there, go ahead and challenge me. No one has. Um, that's it. That's the record. And so, as I say in the end, of course. Uh, are you hurt by the um, betrayal of colleagues? Yes, you are. That's just a human thing. But do you carry it as a day-to-day -day grudge? No. Uh, Mum always had this great saying, what you need to do, Kev, is put it into your forgettery. <laughs> <laughs> Boop. Remember the old computers? Do you remember those ones? They had the little rubbish tin on top? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when Mum saw that the first time, because I was trying to teach Mum how to use a computer, <laughs> which was hazardous in itself, given my computer skills, and uh, she said, that's a forgettery. <laughs> Blip. <laughs> really helps. Um, so um, one, one of the relationships um, that uh, was victim to that was, was the relationship you had with Wayne Swan, um, although it's clear from this book and the previous one that that may not have been as rosy as, 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 as it not appeared entirely, in the public no. mm. But uh, And you mentioned in this book that you haven't spoken to, to Swan since the coup. That's uh, true. Is, is that still the case? Yeah, by and large. I think uh, occasionally just at a like the Labor Party launch here in uh, Brisbane, what, uh, in May this year. Mm. Um, I think I saw him just to say hello, but that's about it. No, we've not had a conversation, yeah. that's true. And, and the same with Julia Gillard? That's true as well. I mean, uh, we were happy families uh, for the Labor Party launch. You may have seen the photographs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know one of those Christmas shots with the whole extended family where, you know, there's the second cousin over there you'd happily biff, yeah. <laughs> The, uh, or would be few. Um, but no, uh, as I said, forgiving and forgetting are different things. You can't forget, you can't forgive. And I actually have no angst or anger or anything about that about these folks because it just eats away at you if it does. I just generally don't. Um, but uh, my criticism of both of them is 
if you really had a genuine problem with the government at the time, of which one of you was Deputy Prime Minister and the other was Treasurer, then why did you not come and say it? Or why did you not raise it in the Cabinet as a formal matter? Why did you try to execute your political ambitions through a midnight coup? I mean, it's a pretty basic thing, isn't it? Because when Hawkey was Prime Minister, uh, the colleagues would regularly go into him and say, mate, there's a problem here, blah, 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 you've got to do this or that, or Paul come and take your head off, or Paul would come and say the same, mate, you've got to do this. Like, this is relatively normal in political parties. Um, uh, so it was the secrecy of it all, which I think was profoundly un-Australian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, and you say this in the book, but I, I think that actually seriously changed the nature of, of national politics mm -hmm. in Australia at the time, that um, Australians who weren't heavily engaged in, in political life would go to bed one night thinking mm -hmm. they knew who the Prime Minister was and they'd get up the next morning it was someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, uh, it seems to me that that's one of the things that's eroded uh, confidence and, and trust in our institutions. There's many other things too. But um, do you think that 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 the measures that both parties have put in place, and I know you put, the you put the measure in place for Labor and now Morrison has for the Conservatives, do you think those measures can help restore confidence in, um, in political leadership? Backing up one minute slightly, the, um, I think the other thing which shocked people on the morning of the coup was uh, not that it was, they were just unprepared for it as the body politic of the country, a few media smarties may have known, you know, those working with the conspirators, but um, it was, there was no reason given. Um, the post facto reason was, uh, one, we would have lost the subsequent 2010 election, except I've been ahead in every opinion poll for four years, uh, except one where we went down to 51.49. And two, um, the, uh, the subsequent, this, is, this actually became quite hurtful in Julia's book, she infers and then later says quite strongly uh, that I'd lost my marbles. In other words, you know, we had a you know, crisis on our hands, you know, the, the guy at the top has, um, has uh, got uh, bats free in the belfry. And, um, uh, and so I think both of those attempts to construct a rationale for the coup were just never persuasive. Uh, for the Australian public, and the other problem with them is they're just completely fabricated. In fact, no one would actually, apart from those two individuals, would agree with them in subsequent interviews by journalists around the country and the books that have been written. So I think that kind of shocked people. And when you look at the subsequent shocks to the system vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, what happened between, say, Turnbull and Morrison, uh, again, there's no real rationale given other than internal party political ambition, frankly. Uh, the Shakespearean condition, you know. Uh, since Julius Caesar through Macbeth and on to, um, uh, and on to uh, Hamlet. On the rule changes that I made, uh, my precondition for coming back as Prime Minister in 2013, and what I knew was an unwinnable election, where my job was to minimise the loss in 2013. Uh, because when I took over the leadership, again, we were behind 60-40 in the polls, and that would mean the Labor Party would be reduced to a rump of 25 seats. Um, every seat in Queensland except mine would have been lost, and nationwide as well. And it had been that way for, as you remember, for months and months and months and months and months. Um, but I said, to come back, even though I'm going to lose this election, and set it up for you, Bill, um, uh, there will be a rule change. And the rule change, for those of you who haven't followed the details, is you can no longer have a midnight coup. The future election of the Labor Party will be through a 50% vote of the Parliamentary Party and a 50% vote of the entire national membership of the ALP. So therefore, the opportunity to just walk in and say it's over sunshine goes. It's a much more complex process. And so they all said, yeah, 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 that's fine. And then I become Prime Minister, and then a few of the smarties come in and say, ah, mate, I always worry when they come in from the New South Wales right and say, mate, um, mate, um, you know that rule change? I said, yeah. I said, why don't we do it after the election? I said, you mean when I'm no longer Prime Minister? 
no, 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 I think we can win. Um, to which I said, if you want another leader within two weeks, uh, you're heading the right way. <laughs> so we convened, as you'd probably remember, a special meeting of the caucus. That's right. And I took them to the Balmain Town Hall where the, where the Labor Party had its first ever caucus meeting in the 1890s. I said, this is where we began, and this is a real change that we will make, the first of its type in 100 years. Um, and as a result, we restored stability in our side of politics. Uh, Morrison and the Tories thought this was just a uniquely Labor Party problem. Well, it wasn't. History's demonstrated that. Um, and belatedly, he's adopted the model. So will it work long term? I think um, no rule is ever a fail-safe guarantee, but this, I think, reduces the risk of it uh, by about, you know, 75, 80%. Uh, they can still suspend these rules, technically, but it just makes it much harder politically to just walk in and say, OK, sunshine, I want your job, goodbye. Because mm. the nation doesn't want that. The nation elects people. Australians think carefully about who they elect, actually, and they make a judgment and they expect to either reward or punish that person at the next election. It's because the people who decide. It's the people's democracy, not ours. So around the world now, we're seeing um, a, a lot of alienation from the political process. People are, uh, don't have confidence or trust in, in public institutions. Um, do you think that this is now the new normal, or, or can we get back to where we were, where there was uh, some confidence in, in, in governments and, and big organisations to deliver? If we describe the quote, what you said, the new normal, as the rise of, let's call it the authoritarian right, mm. uh, in this country, elements of one nation-ism, but frankly, uh, Trump's Republican Party uh, UKIP, uh, now the Brexit party in the UK, uh, alternative for Deutschland in Germany and the Front National in France and its derivatives, the People's Parties of Northern Europe and Austria. Um, something's happening. Uh, and the populism that it represents uh, from the right and the far right is you have a big problem in your society, you are not getting the same economic opportunities as you used to. And the reason for that is you should blame them. Foreigners, Muslims, blacks, uh, and even extremists, uh, gays, and in the subtext of some of this stuff, if you read the literature carefully from the authoritarian right, feminists as well. It's always them, okay? I think we've seen this script a few times in history. It didn't end well um, when uh, we saw it emerge in the 30s. So that, I think, is structurally what's happening. So therefore, the root cause of it uh, is the economy, and hence your book, and hence in large part mine, which is unless we continue to re-engineer long-term sustainable growth, but sufficiently redistribute that wealth so that everyone has a stake in the future, everyone has equality of opportunity, and a humane safety net, and an ability to help you on the way through if you run into a great brick wall in your life, um, while still respecting the underpinning principles of the market, uh, unless we do that, then frankly, the economic conditions will continue to further turbocharge these, what I describe as social reactions from people who lose confidence in the mainstream political process, and then political demagogues who walk in to take further political advantage of that. Is it permanent? No, uh, I, I've never had a determinist view of history. We shape the future. These two hands, your two hands, and what's in your head, and our powers of collective imagination to shape the future of politics. And I see among young people today a fresh urgency, interest, commitment, and passion to re-energize progressive politics in a manner which becomes politically sustainable, but at the same time does the tasks on economic, social, and climate policy that we need to see done. Uh, and I, I see that myself. Uh, I know with with my own with my own children, they're very engaged in the issues of the world, uh, in the way you're talking about. But climate is the issue that really mm. grabs young people, isn't it? Um, you tried, but but didn't but, but didn't get to where you wanted to on climate. Looking back at that, would you do it differently? 
Well, the degree of difficulty we had was kind of three things happening at once. Global financial crisis, and so uh, your um, former employers, uh, Murdoch, uh, through uh, the name that dare not be mentioned in any public conversation, but who actually shapes so much of our national political conversation today. Uh, the silent presence around every dinner table, 70% of the print media, uh, run through a largely uh, ideological agenda and partly a commercial one. Apart from that, I don't have a strong view. <laughs> um, but Murdoch is a climate change denier. Lachlan Murdoch is a climate change denier. But, but he wasn't at that time, Kevin. I don't know, but I mean, progressively. Yeah, but since, since that time, he has well, become... Well, frankly, yeah. as of about eight, nine, while I was in office, uh, no, there wasn't an anti-climate change campaign in seven, you're mm. correct. But when the measures began to be outlined, they really hardened. And so, whether it was the mandatory renewable energy target of 20% renewables by 2020, vicious campaign from the Oz, not your paper, um, the, uh, the Courier Mail at that stage. Um, secondly, um, the carbon price, the emissions trading scheme, the carbon pollution reduction scheme was depicted by the Australian uh, as the uh, impending destruction of our national economy. Um, and uh, since then, a rolling campaign against any form of climate change substantive action. So what did we achieve? Uh, the mandatory renewable energy target, despite multiple efforts by the uh, Conservatives, remains on the statute books. When I became Prime Minister, renewables represented 4% of Australian electricity supply. Today, they represent 19.5% of electricity supply. We've created a renewable energy industry in this country. It wasn't here before. We did that. Our law. So I'm proud of that. I think legitimately so. Uh, on the carbon price, the bloody Greens, the Green Party, uh, forms a coalition with the Conservatives and defeats twice our, uh, our carbon price in the Senate. And had they not done that, we'd be 10 years into a carbon price and the gradual transformation of the Australian economy into a lower carbon economy bit by bit. That's what it was designed to do. So did we have, therefore, comprehensive wins? No. Did we try our best? Yes. Did we throw every piece of political energy we had at it? Yeah. Um, but again, on the internal politics of our show, uh, both uh, Julia and Wayne... Uh, one of their big internal critiques of me in the lead up to the coup uh, was that um, I had too much climate change religion um, and I was going too far and too fast. And they uh, stated that they could not support uh, uh, us uh, continuing to fight for a carbon price. That was the lead up to the 2010 election. So at some stage in the future, um, a historian will write um, a book which maybe describes every government in a paragraph or two. Um, um, how, how do you think you would like your government to be described? Now, this, I know this is a big ask. I'm going to ask you to describe it briefly. Um, well, no. This I... is the brief version, isn't it? <laughs> but no, you need two volumes to do that. Yeah. So, uh... But let's, let's, I mean, you, you, you like uh, playing around on Twitter, but if... if if you were that historian, or you were able to um, persuade that historian how to describe your government, what are the words you would, you would use to describe it? On length, by the way, um, people often criticise the length of these books. Um, I kind of have a different view, which is I actually think the nation needs some complexity. Not everything's simple, mm. OK? And therefore, if we continue to dumb everything down, into a few sound bites and a few trite phrases. I don't think the substantive contest of ideas or the marshalling of facts is taken forward one bit. So I make no apology for there being, you know, half a million words there. Um, the um, good luck. The um, <laughs> but it's a great doorstop, as my wife Therese regularly says. Um, I think. Um, the danger with sort of self-summarising your own government uh, is that you'll just be seen as up yourself. Um, um, and the, one of the nice things about Australian culture is this levelling instinct we do have. Uh, it then bleeds into what I describe as an excessive assault on anyone who is seen as a tall poppy. 
but the leveling instinct's a good one. So for fear of being up myself, um, what would I s want to be described as, or the government, or me? Um, uh, proud son of the Queensland country. Um, by instinct, a global citizen. And never seeing the contradiction between the two, ever. Um, uh, influenced by his mum and the stories of the Great Depression, acted decisively to prevent a second one hitting this country and succeeded. Worked hard to create the G20 and Australia being a member of it, the first time in our entire history we're at the world's top table. And apart from that, I hope a prime minister and a government which in its heart never ever forgot what it was like to be poor and hence what we sought to do with pensions, with hospitals and with schools. And finally, someone who when he met with Indigenous Australians, always asked himself the question, what would I want to happen if that was me? And began a process of long-term reconciliation and closing the gap. And the coda would be, God, I wish I had more time <laughs> <laughs> to get the rest of it done. Yeah. Um, so um, let's talk about what you're doing now. <laughs> that was two paragraphs, by the way. <laughs> Bullshit, that was one. <laughs> it was just one of those paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> I should introduce you to the full stop. <laughs> <laughs> I've always regarded them as a curse. <laughs> when a good colon or semicolon can permanently prolong the length of That's a sentence. It's a parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> parentheses and dashes. You can put parentheses, dashes, colons and semicolons into one sentence. It could roll to an entire paragraph. <laughs> That's before you take breath. Yeah. Um, let's talk about what you're doing now. Um, uh, you're here at the moment. Uh, you're, you're based in New York. I'm just trying to get a sense of where your priorities are and how, how you organise yourself. Uh, because I often see you popping up. You're in New York one day and you may be in China a couple of days later. Then perhaps you're in, in Europe. How is this working? Handball is the... Um, handball. The, um, I play handball uh, with the kids of Australia. Any handballers here, by the way? No, you're all a bookish type. Like, oh, you're a handballer? Good to see you, mate. OK, sign you a ball later on. The, um, we put out... It's kind of an accident of history, but I was over up the road here a few years ago at State High to deliver a public lecture. Um, uh, and I arrived early, unusual for me. And uh, the kids on the court challenged me to a game. And then they stuck the video up on, uh, on social media and then it kind of progressively went viral. And so I stuck out a challenge recently, uh, or an invitation to kids around the country. Uh, if they wanted a uh, signed handball to write in, and, or if they wanted a game. So we got uh, social media impressions in reach of 1.6 million and 11,000 requests for signed handballs, and God knows how many schools have challenged me to play a game. So my last two weeks have been playing bloody handball. <laughs> so, um, but we're doing that to promote the National Apology Foundation for Indigenous Australians. The little handballs will soon be printed with our, our logo on it. Um, a quick summary of what we, uh, where we're placed. I'm employed by the um, Asia Policy Institute, which is the think tank of the Asia Society in New York. I'm their president. Um, it's a Rockefeller institution, which has been around for about three quarters of a century, set up with one mission statement, which was to build uh, political, cultural, and economic ties between uh, Asia and the United States. 
um, and in the current crisis of US-China relations in particular, um, three quarters of my time is spent on that, whether it's the trade wars um, or the risk of a, a genuine shoot 'em up between the two of them. So uh, from here, I fly to Beijing tomorrow. Uh, I'll be have um, conversations with friends in the Chinese leadership. When I get back, I'll get off to Washington and speak to people there. So we do a lot of behind the scenes chat about how do you try and keep this under control. And in the US, I spend a lot of time uh, doing uh, US public media, trying to inject what I hope is a more balanced rationality uh, to uh, that discussion, which at present is careering in a quite an ugly direction. Uh, there's a book out last year in the United States or the year before called Destined for War, written by a Harvard colleague of mine, um, Graham Allison. Uh, and I'm currently writing the response to that as well, which is called The Avoidable War for the US market, because there is no competing uh, narrative. So the bulk of what I do is that. Um, and, um, and, uh, and for my charitable side, I'm chair of the Global Partnership of Sanitation and Water for All, which is sustainable development goal number six for those of you who follow the UN sustainable development goals, um, which means that I'm, as my sons remind me, the global sultan of shit. Uh, so, uh, so it's basically how do you provide sustainable sanitation for poor countries in the world, which as you know, is the greatest determinant of uh, longevity and dealing with uh, problems of infant mortality and the rest. So there's that and coming back here from time to time and we're always back here. Uh, when, the, when the weather's good and we can do so, because so many of our family are and, here. And are you, are you doing a PhD at Oxford? Yeah. How's that going? It's good. The, um, so I pity my supervisors having to put up with me. But, um, so I hope to finish that in early 2021. The, th the subject is, uh, is uh, Xi Jinping's worldview. Um, so I'm doing it at the Oxford China Centre. And I'm a fellow, not a fellow, I'm a, a member of Jesus College Oxford and the reason people ask me why did you want to go to Jesus College and the answer is I always wanted to have an email address which had kevin.rudd at Jesus, so, <laughs> which I now have, <laughs> well, you've which heard is there. good for me not so good for Jesus. You've, so. got, you, you've got Kevin's private email address now. <laughs> um, you've got it. Yeah. So, so Kevin, uh, uh, when we started this I, I, I mentioned that we'd probably been having conversations of various sorts over, for over 30 years, and a lot of them were in so-called smoke-filled rooms, uh, not many of them public like this. But a consistent pattern through that time is, is you've always had a plan, uh, whether it was a plan for winning government in Queensland, what you would do in government, whether it was going into federal politics, whether it was rising through the party, whether it was starting to think about being prime minister. All the way, there's always been a plan. Do you have a plan now? What I'm trying to do here, you mean in, in Australia? No, just gen, no, a plan for Kevin. Well, no, my, uh, the plan for the POK, PFK, plan for Kevin. I don't really think in those particular terms. I think in terms of mission, to be quite honest. What am I actually committed to doing? I actually am really worried about the trajectory of US-China taking us all into an economic and general war over the course of the next decade. So why I'm doing what I'm doing is, given I have a reasonable profile within China itself and a reasonable profile within the United States, is to just try, through what I do, behind the scenes and in the public debate, to describe an alternative trajectory. I've, I've been around long enough to know that ideas matter and that ideas can, not always, but can shape particular political behaviours. For this country, um, I'm a bit like you. I mean, you've put a lot of effort into putting this together. Uh, I've just done a series of four or five lectures around Australia, apart from playing handball, uh, to universities, Sydney, Melbourne, ANU, uh, Brizzy, um, entitled, the series is called The Complacent Country, because I actually think we've become utterly complacent about the future of our economy, as you do, obviously. Uh, about the risk of recession next year, um, about how we substantively, not rhetorically, deal uh, with the rise of China, the response of America, and how do we navigate a future through that. Complacent about climate, 
to the extent that it just frightens me and frightens my kids and grandkids even more. And so what I'm trying to do, the plan for Kevin, is to uh, write and lecture as much as I can when I'm back in Australia about what constitutes the elements of a forward-looking progressive agenda for the country, not just in its policy but in its politics as well. Having great policy ideas is one thing. If politically you're incapable of delivering it through the machinery of uh, our national politics, then it's all, you know, hot air. And so that's where my mind uh, on the home front is at the moment, and working with friends and colleagues, including Albo, uh, on those sorts of questions. Right. Well, in terms of program specificity... No, uh, programmatic specificity. Programmatic... Sorry, I'll stand corrected. <laughs> Our time's up. Um, so, uh, on that note, I'd like to uh, say thanks very much for uh, the conversation today. And if people want to have a chat, apparently I'm signing books. Where am I signing books, folks? Oh, the book signing room. <laughs> very smart answer. <laughs> book signing room, wherever that is, I'm there. So, if you want to have a chat, I'll be Do, there. Can, can someone minutes. just... Does everyone know where the book signing room is? Yep. Yeah. Just, just follow the crowds. Okay. So, uh, as they say in the Labor Party, when you go to vote, vote early, vote often, um, and uh, buy lots of books. I'd appreciate yeah. it very much. Nice to be with you. <laughs>